Shalom and uh, Erev Tov uh, here in Jerusalem and uh, whatever it is, uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning for those uh, from the um, uh, West Coast. Uh, it's wonderful to be together again and uh, this time uh, I will be providing the, uh, the entertainment, I'll be providing the uh, analysis of where we are on matters of religion and state and pluralism, and now a year after the elections for the Knesset in Israel. Uh, just a reminder, the Knesset elections took place uh, on March a year ago, and in June, uh, it'll be a year since the new coalition, the new government uh, was established. Um, I want to uh, express my uh, appreciation and gratitude to our co-sponsors, uh, to Ruach Hidush, Rabbis and Cantors for Religious Freedom and Equality in Israel, uh, to JPLAN, the Jewish Pluralism Legal Action Network, and to the American Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. Uh, it'll be a mix of some rabbinic issues, some legal issues, as we often do. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it will be relevant also to the question of how does all of that connect with you, dear friends, uh, activists, leaders, rabbis, cantors in the uh, in the diaspora. Uh, the um, um, let me just. Okay, so a reminder as to how the uh, coalition was formed. Uh, if you remember, Israel had uh, repeated uh, election uh, circles, cycles, uh, and this government uh, was uh, created uh, with, uh, as you can see, very little uh, basis uh, to be counting on in terms of holding a majority. Uh, this coalition enjoys a mere a majority of 61 out of the 120 uh, Knesset members, and we'll see shortly that uh, that is a major obstacle that the coalition finds uh, difficult to um, deal with uh, at times and some unexpected considerations have come up uh, that make it even more difficult. So when you look at this pie chart, uh, you realize not only that we are dealing merely with 61 out of the 120, which means that any one Knesset member can basically um, prevent the coalition from uh, being able to pass legislation and to gain majority uh, in votes, and that has happened repeatedly during those months. But you can see one more thing, and that is there are two blocks according to the coalition agreements. There is the Yamina block. Well, not that much of a block. It consists of Yamina and New Hope, six Knesset members for each. 12 altogether. And then the other block is the Yeshatid block. Now, Yeshatid, uh, Yair Lapid's party, is the party that uh, received the mandate to form the coalition. And, um, uh, and uh, it pursued negotiations with each of the relevant parties, relevant factions in the Knesset, until he was able to put together this coalition that consists of a slim majority. So the Yesh Atid bloc consists of the other parties other than Ra'am, the Islamist Arab party that has four seats. So as you can see, each of those factions can bring the coalition down. Now, in one way, this means this coalition is particularly vulnerable and weak. On the other hand, it is a source of its strength and whereas the opposition hoped that within a few days, a few weeks, a few months, this coalition will fall. It actually didn't. Because when you have such a slim majority, people pay extra attention and try extra hard uh, to hold together. But what happened was that in contrast to the promises, for instance, made by Yesh Atid and Yair Lapid, 
that this time around, it's going to be a small government. It's going to be an economical government. It's going to be an effective government. Well, as you can see, the ratio of ministers for um, Knesset members is uh, horrendous. So uh, New Hope is six Knesset members and four ministers. Uh, and, uh, and Yamina has only three, but it has the prime ministership. Um, and as you compare the Yamina block and their spoils, and you can see now the ministerial and the uh, prime minister position, compared to the Yesh Atid block, you'll see that the Yesh Atid block uh, was rather uh, disadvantaged uh, in comparison and, uh, and accepted this, uh, uh, this uh, lesser share in the pie. Uh, Ram supports the coalition, it is part of the coalition, but it is not a part of any of the two blocks. And as you can see, it does not hold ministerial positions. It does hold the chairmanship of a Knesset committee um, and, uh, and Mansour uh, Abbas serves as the deputy, as a deputy uh, speaker of the Knesset. So this is the face of the uh, fragile coalition. And now let's delve into the issues with one point that I want to make. Uh, Eric, uh, Rabbi Eric Yoffi mentioned his uh, article in Haaretz that was published today in which he addresses the uh, challenge posed by the uh, absorption of the uh, Ukrainian refugees. And the question is, does Israel accept non-Jewish refugees? Now, of course it accepts non-Jewish refugees because in the Ukraine, and um, uh, I think that uh, those who attended the uh, uh, webinar with Professor Sergio de la Pergola, you will recall that whereas it is estimated that there are or were 48,000 Jews in the Ukraine, there are 200,000 individuals who are eligible to make Aliyah under the law of return. Now, how does that happen? Because the 200,000, while they include only 48,000 Jews, the rest, 150,000 plus, are family members of Jews. They could be spouses, they could be children, they could be grandchildren of Jews. All are eligible to make Aliyah under the law of return. So there are 200,000 uh, uh, individuals who are eligible to make Aliyah from the Ukraine under the law of return and receive Israeli citizenship and receive the benefits that go with it, etc. But there was a question of will Israel, should Israel be accepting non-Jewish, non-individuals uh, who are not eligible under the law of return, but are refugees nevertheless. And we all see the heartbreaking scenes coming out of, uh, of the Ukraine. Should Israel be providing them with refuge? Should Israel open its arms to accept them and resettle them and at least provide them with temporary refuge? Well, why does this, why is this relevant to our discussion of religion and state? Well, you'll read uh, Rabbi Eric Yoffi's article, and he promises us that he has addressed the questions of how is all of that connected to the challenge of conversion and who is a Jew, and the larger issue of should Israel accept them. I will add to that, and he may have written it as well. I will add the overriding question that we address is not just a question of religion and state in the narrow sense of the word, but also the larger question of what does it mean for Israel to be a Jewish and democratic state? What's the requirement for a state to be a Jewish state? And what does democracy add, detract, balance to the Jewish aspect of its core identity? Well, as you may know, there is a heated debate in Israel in the last month or so, again, between two blocks, between two camps, with the likes of the Minister of the Interior, Rabbi, eh, eh, Minister Ayelet Shaked, eh, being at the forefront of the camp, of course, with all the Haredi Knesset members, 
the ultra-Orthodox class members, who repeatedly write about it, preach about it, push uh, uh, and, and demean the, uh, those like uh, Minister Nachman Shai and uh, Minister Yair Lapid and others who are advocating the, 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 the opening of hands in order to uh, provide a, a, a home, even a temporary home, uh, for the uh, Ukrainian refugees. Because, says Shaked, and say the ultra-Orthodox uh, um, Knesset members, and say other members of Yamina, and say many members of the Likud, Israel as a Jewish state should be a home for Jews, period. We are doing ourselves a major concession by allowing a limited number of refugees to come. It was a smaller number. They allowed a larger number now, slightly larger. Maybe we'll exceed this by 20 a day. You realize that we are dealing with extreme resentment of ideological resentment, religious resentment, of the notion that Israel as a Jewish and democratic state would learn from its historic experience and say, we have been Avadim, we have been slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, we have been refugees, we have been persecuted, we have been hunted down, and we were looking for refuge, and we will learn the historical experience and the moral, uh, uh, um, uh, the moral uh, um, command of providing that to other refugees, which we have been denied in our dark hours. That is not what Minister Shaked and her uh, partners are saying uh, in terms of what does a Jewish and democratic state say. So we have a much deeper, much more existential battle over what does it mean for Israel to be a Jewish state. I won't be saying any more about that. I'm sure that Rabbi Eric Yoffe has a lot more to offer. So I uh, uh, urge you to um, uh, uh, look up Haaretz of today and read his, uh, his article. So back to the issues, narrower issue of um, what does Israel as a Jewish and democratic state mean in, in terms of religion and state. So there was a bit of a hoax in terms of the uh, coalition agreements. Um, and uh, those of you who uh, attended our webinar in June of last year, when I spoke about the, uh, the new coalition and the coalition agreements, I won't deal with it at any length, but I'll just remind you because it's relevant to the question of where we are now a year later. So there are, uh, bilateral coalition agreements. Yesh Atid, Yair Lapid, was given the mandate by the president to negotiate with the relevant parties and form a majority coalition. He did. And uh, there were individual coalition agreements signed between Yesh Atid and each of the coalition party uh, uh, um, uh, uh, partner parties. Except in those individual agreements that each of the coalition members had with Yesh Atid, they were very uh, generous, uh, very expensive in terms of including their core demands and um, and uh, expressions of their ideology. So there are all kinds of goodies um, in the coalition agreements that Labour had with Yesh Atid and that Meretz had with Yesh Atid and that Israel Beitenu had with Yesh Atid and some that Blue and White had and some that, uh, no, and, and some that Blue and White. Uh, great, except when it came to the agreement between Yesh Atid and Yamina, they chose to label that agreement as Heskem Hayesod. This is the basic agreement. So the agreement between Yesh Atid and Yamina is the basic agreement. And all other agreements with the other individual coalition members coalition parties, 
include a clause that says that the basic agreement will be overriding all other agreements and that only in so far as the other agreements are not contradicting the basic agreement will they have an effect but when there is a contradiction between those all the other agreements and that of yamina uh, the uh, the agreement with yamina will prevail well so let's look at what the agreement with Yamina, the basic agreement, uh, says about issues of religion and state. The status quo regarding issues connected with matters of religion and state will be preserved, including on matters of personal status, conversion, yeshiva students, Shabbat, kashrut, the rabbinate, marriage and divorce, except for matters regarding which it would be decided to advance change, whether in the framework of this agreement or with the consent of all coalition factions. So the overriding general principle is maintaining the status quo. One can break the status quo, one can move beyond the status quo on religious affairs, in one of two instances, either we have agreed on it specifically in this agreement, namely the agreement with Yamina, or everybody agrees to it. And you'll soon see that the everybody agrees to it obviously was intended to give Yamina uh, some uh, dominance, some advantage over others to prevent uh, breaches of the status quo uh, that they are not supporting, uh, even though, as you know, I mean, the whole thing was mind boggling. They have six seats, six out of the 61. But clearly, Naftali Bennett must be a great poker player because everybody blinked first. He demanded to be the prime minister. It's almost inconceivable that Yesh Atid with 17 seats would give preference to Yamina with six seats. So the best that they could achieve was to decide that they would change midway. And frankly, in Israel today and for some time now, every day almost, there is some news, some updates, some questions raised as to will there really be a shuffling of the roles? with many suggesting that that's not going to come about. And, uh, and uh, why wouldn't it come about? Not because of Naftali Bennett per se, because everybody assumes that Naftali Bennett has very little to look forward to if he does not go through with the agreements and doesn't take on in about a year and a half the role of alternate prime minister. And now, as you may have seen, received a, a commitment to entrust to him the sort of um, overriding uh, responsibility for um, the Iranian issues, for the Iranian challenge. But others who may not be as concerned as he is, um, whether it's uh, Ayelet Shaked herself or whether it's people like uh, uh, like Edith Silman, the uh, coalition whip, or Neil Orbach, or others who have repeatedly expressed dissatisfaction with the tenor, ten, uh, the, the tenor of this new coalition. So Yamina has the sort of dominant role in agreeing to or preventing any move, any significant move on issues of religion and state. Now, what issues of religion and state or what level of issues of religion and state are we uh, talking about? It does speak about the status quo, but specifically we now see it says, therefore, no governmental legislation, whether primary or secondary, namely whether laws or uh, um, secondary laws, regulations, bylaws, will be advanced, nor shall private legislation be approved, 
if it constitutes a change to the status quo on religious matters, except that which has been explicitly agreed upon. So either you get everybody to agree or else it has to be spelled out in the agreement with Yamina. Knowing that you realize that, you know, wonderful flowery words may have been written in the individual coalition agreements. They are something that one can deliver a sermon about, but not really act upon other than potentially in an administrative manner, but not by advancing legislation that is required to implement them. So I chose to start with a Kotel agreement, uh, even though uh, for the average Israeli, that is probably the least uh, concern. But I know that many on this call and many in, uh, especially in, uh, in North America, uh, do attach tremendous importance to the Kotel Agreement. So the uh, coalition agreements with Labour and with Israel Beitenu and with Blue and White is very clear. It explicitly say, implement and fully fund the resolution 1075 of January 31st, 2016, namely the Kotel Agreement. Great, except that's not happening. And while for, for, for some time it was thought that this was going to materialize, this was going to be uh, realized, then just a little while ago, January 28th, 2022, uh, the Jerusalem Post and other media is saying Bennett to Post government won't be able to implement Kotel, Kotel Compromise. So instead of implementing the Kotel Compromise, uh, he is talking about the same that Netanyahu was talking about, namely upgrading and enlarging and creating an even more respectable section. As I said, there is no added promise and no added value in what Bennett is saying to what Netanyahu has been saying all along and has responded to the Supreme Court in the pending case over the Kotel. Now, the, the Supreme Court has not ruled yet. Will it rule that the government is under obligation to implement the Kotel Agreement? We'll see. Chidush is one of the peti petitioners. The lead petitioner is Iraq and the women of the wall. And, uh, and of course, the movements, the reform and conservative movements, we have joined in the petition. But will the court order the government to implement it? I don't know. The problem, of course, is that this is a political agreement. And as a rule, political agreements are not viewed as legally enforceable. We'll see. Another issue that is of tremendous interest to you and to me, uh, but frankly, again, not so much to Israelis. Israelis occasionally, you know, bend out of shape over conversion. For instance, when some years ago there was the notion uh, uh, presented by the representative of the state in the Supreme Court in a conversion pending case, that the, there was some problem with the army conversions, the conversions of mostly Russian Olim that took place uh, while they served in the IDF. And this caused a hullabaloo. People were upset and angry. Obviously, it has to do with these individuals who sacrificed their life who take full part in the uh, uh, responsibility for maintaining Israel's security and well-being, etc., are being challenged by those who refuse to take part in the uh, burden of security, uh, who delegitimize them as Jews, who delegitimize the conversion process, who delegitimize the Orthodox rabbis who are involved in the process. That caused quite a uh, quite an upset um, and and a storm in the public until. <laughs> until the late Rabbi Ovadia Yosef uh, was drawn into the uh, into the storm, and uh, and after some time looking into it, he ruled that the conversions done in the IDF are valid and legitimate. Uh, and the next day, there was graffiti in Mer Sharim all over, with the writing Ovadia Yosef not Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, just Ovadia Yosef, equal, the equal sign, reform. So for 
Rabbi of Adi Yosef, the leader of Shas, the former chief rabbi of Israel, uh, deciding that the orthodox conversions done in the IDF are legitimate and the individuals who were converted according to all the requirements of halakha are Jewish, that was sufficient in order to remove his rabbinic title and to equate him to reform. And as you know, for those who have been reading our newsletter, you surely know, reform is now almost a, you know, a, a, a common term a, a, that's repeated multiple times. Israel's government is reform. Bennett is reform. Kahana is reform. Everybody they don't like, everybody they detest, everybody they describe as potentially or in actuality destroying Judaism is reform. So, uh, and my poor colleagues and friends in the conservative movement, as a rule, they just can't get their name stuck in there in any way. And um, so bear in mind, reform is a generic form of curse. Uh, not a particular expression of singling out the Union for Reform Judaism or the Movement for Reform Judaism uh, or Liberal Judaism in, uh, in England or elsewhere. Okay, so conversion, and I'll, I'll preface uh, the issue of conversion because as I said, Yamina really got the big prize in the lottery in those negotiations. Uh, so with its six members, it got the prime ministership, but it also got the position of Minister of Religious Services. Uh, and as you know, Minister of the Interior, Ayelet Shaked. And they basically control most religious matters. Through Ayelet Shaked in terms of registration of conversions, uh, under the law of return, a registration in the population registry and giving them uh, the uh, status of new immigrants under the law of return, but more importantly, with uh, the Minister of Religious Services, who is overseeing, uh, at least administratively, conversion and kashrut and funding uh, and uh, the selection of uh, the city rabbis and chief rabbis and the members of religious councils and leaders of religious councils, etc., etc., etc. Lots of goodies in the religious basket in the hands of Yamina. So they negotiated and reached an agreement regarding conversion. Now, you don't have to read it right now. Again, I'll be sending you the, uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> PowerPoint presentation and you'll be able to remind yourself. But if you see it, there is a very clear um, agreement. The agreement is to amend the British mandatory ordinance called the Religious Community Change Ordinance so that it would recognize city rabbis as eligible to or authorized to establish conversion courts and their conversions would be valid. So very specific as to what legal change should take place. It's in the mandatory ordinance that controls the recognition of conversions for the purpose of applying the jurisdiction of religious courts, rabbinic courts. And it's about city rabbis added to the chief rabbi in this ordinance. By the way, those legislative changes on this matter and on Kashrut, we'll see that in a minute, uh, the appendix to the uh, uh, guidelines for the government, the legislation appendix includes a timeline, the amendments of this law would be advanced within 60 days. So a very rapid legislative process was envisaged. Lo and behold, Kahana's and Yamina's appetite was much greater than what was agreed to. And there was, as you can see alluded to, there was in the legislation appendix, there was a specific legislative amendment attached. This is the amendment that we are in agreement uh, uh, regarding passing. 
So his appetite was great. No, he doesn't want just an amendment to the religious community change ordinance. He wants a full package conversion bill. For the first time in Israel's history, there is going to be a conversion bill. If you ask yourselves, how is it that reformed conservative conversions were recognized through the courts in our numerous uh, uh, court cases, starting with Susan Miller back in 86. Some of you remember, some of you may have been involved. I'm looking at Rabbi Eric Yoffe, Rabbi Eric Yoffe and myself put together this concept of a who is a Jew action center, which we operated uh, and in, in truth, it consisted of Susan Miller's case. But we understood that it really was something that was much bigger and put to test the government policies regarding recognition of non-Orthodox conversions. So uh, we were able to receive recognition for Susan Miller and for numerous converts since then in the civil arena, in terms of the law of return and in terms of registration in the population registry because there was no law on conversion. And since there was no law on conversion, and the population registry law and the law of return included, since the Shalit case back in 1970, included the ambiguous word Nitgayer was converted. And of course, rejected Chabad Lubavitch's demand that it says Nitgayer uh, Kalacha, converted according to Halacha. On the basis of that, the Supreme Court has repeatedly and consistently said, Reform conservative conversions are just as good in terms of the civil arena, not for marriage, because marriage is controlled by this religious community change ordinance. Ironically, and you may not know it, you may have read that Rabbi Riskin and Rabbi David Stav and Rabbi Amsalem and the late Rabbi Rabinowitz and others have come together with the assistance of uh, uh, Itim, Rabbi Sh uh, Shaul uh, Salt Faber, um, this Orthodox uh, Advocacy Center, uh, they came together to create an alternative conversion framework called Giyur Kalacha, Giyur Conversion According to Halacha. And Riskin and, uh, and Stav, etc., are converting as part of that framework. Now, the chief rabbi that doesn't recognize their conversions. How are they able to get their converts registered? Ironically, on the basis of the precedents that we have gotten through the Supreme Court in defense of, in, in uh, uh, advocacy for reform and conservative converts. <laughs> so it is our groundwork that has enabled them to get recognition, limited recognition for civil purposes, for the conversions. And of course, they are not grateful. Uh, none of that can be seen in any of their pronouncements. As a matter of fact, they are as adamant that reform and conservative conversion shouldn't be recognized as the chief rabbinities. And, uh, and, uh, and in their efforts, uh, what they are looking for and what Minister Kahana is supporting is, God forbid, this isn't about reform and conservative. This is about expanding the scope of recognition of conversions done by more modern and more lenient, supposedly, uh, uh, rab Orthodox rabbis, uh, and that was the thrust of it. So here, Kahana, instead of settling for what was specifically and explicitly agreed upon, including a language of an amendment, he is now putting forth a full-fledged conversion bill that for the first time in Israel's history creates a basis for the dominance, uh, the superiority of orthodox conversions and the, uh, and the machinery that will operate them. Now, why have our partners in labor and merits, etc., agreed to it? I have no idea. These, there was no reason for them to agree to it because as you can see, 
<laughs> what they agreed to and what supposedly should be stuck to, adhered to, with no break unless everybody agrees, is a very narrow and specific legislation. They say that they have been promised that the new law would not undermine, would not erode the existing re recognition of reform and conservative conversions. We don't have to uh, time the time to go into the legalities. I have grave doubts whether the interpretation that they are attaching to it is indeed valid and whether future cases before the courts would not be decided differently because the law certainly does not promise continued recognition even in the civil arena for reform and conservative conversions. It uses some ambiguous language, which I think is self-contradictory, but here is the irony. A few days ago, Kahana and uh, those who worked with him on the um, conversion bill visited the US uh, for a week, and he went around trying to gain support for his conversion bill. Now, let's see what he was saying. He was saying, Kahana's message is twofold. Israel is the natural home for all denominations across the spectrum of Judaism, while preserving its identity based on the halacha and orthodox tradition. The state of Israel in principle is an orthodox state. Kahana said in an interview on Sunday ahead of the meeting with leaders of the Orthodox Union. At the same time, Israel is a place that respects the rights of all minority groups. Of course, so long as the Orthodox agree that those rights are legitimate. Uh, so, for instance, when it comes to the right to officiate at weddings, too bad. <laughs> you know, Israel is an Orthodox state, so marriage should be Orthodox. We'll see about marriage in a second. And see the point that we already mentioned. He defended Bennett's decision to shelve the plan to revive the 2017 Kotel deal, which designated protected space at the Western Wall for various streams of Jewish practice amid strong opposition. And of course, uh, he was in for more disappointments. Uh, and uh, yesterday, the Times of Israel carried a message from the leading, uh, they call themselves, all of them, Zionist Orthodox mainstream organizations, the Rabbinic Council of America, uh, RZA, uh, the OU, uh, and uh, uh, Yeshiva University. Minister Kahana, we American Orthodox rabbis can't support your reform. He met with them, he pleaded with them, he tried to convince them, and of course, got nowhere. What are they saying? Israel should learn from our experience in the US. Less than 20 years ago, any rabbi in America who so wished would perform conversions according to his own standards. The result was a complete lack of trust and transparency regarding the Allah equality of those conversions, necessitating individual investigation. Today, because the Israeli rabbinate, namely the chief rabbinate, will not accept unrecognized American conversions, individual rabbis are far less likely to perform freelance conversions. The rabbinate's imposition of a minimum standard contributed greatly to the successful establishment of the Rabbinic Council of America's GPS network of Orthodox conversion courts. This network works with procedures designed to create a positive experience uh, for conversion candidates, ensuring, note, ensuring their continued commitment to Torah and mitzvot, full adherence to Torah and Jewish law while maintaining a specific standard for conversion that has significantly proved the trust and transparency of American conversions. So basically, if you read the Times of Israel article from yesterday, you will see we, our organization, understand that there may, some, may be some lacking, some blemishes with the chief rabbinate, but we stand with the chief rabbinate as an institution we stand with their position and we will not recognize those conversions 
that you will be or may be performing through your uh, intended uh, reform. So uh, I think that this is very revealing. As you may know, those of you who have been involved, uh, when these organizations, and especially the RCA, the Rabbinic Council of America, surrendered, buckled to the pressure of the chief rabbinate and agreed that individual Orthodox rabbis would be denied the uh, legitimacy uh, and the authority to perform conversions and these conversions would be then expected to be recognized in Israel. And they agreed that there would be a, what they call the GPS network, there would be a handful of regional conversion courts that would be individually approved by the chief rabbinate before they can be appointed or operate. As a result of that, courageous, modern Orthodox rabbis, and I'm thinking of Rabbi Mark Angel and Rabbi Avi Weiss, launched an initiative to create the IRF, the International Rabbinic Fellowship. This was the reason the, uh, re the, the unwillingness to accept the surrender of the Rabbinic Council of America. And mind you, Mark Angel was a president of the Rabbinic Council of America. But the unwillingness to accept their surrender to the chief rabbinate in Israel, basically sur uh, surrendering and, and giving up on the autonomy and the, uh, and the authority of individual Orthodox rabbis uh, throughout the country. So as you can see, this has a very relevant North American or American uh, angle to it. And the bottom line is that yesterday, uh, um, uh, Kahana was informed that those that he was hoping to gain the trust of and the support of are turning their back to him. I have no idea. He probably met with reform and conservative leadership. I'm afraid that they, he received support from them. I have no idea why. And I fear that uh, this was short-sighted and not helpful to advancing religious freedom and pluralism. All right. Now, I see that um, we have not gotten very far. I think you got a taste of something that, uh, of some of the things that are unfolding. So I'll just uh, uh, take a couple of minutes, uh, David Saperstein style, namely uh, shotgun style, uh, just uh, mentioning a few points and then I'll stop and take questions and comments, etc. So Israel Beitainu, uh, the marriage and divorce, there was a specific push in the uh, coalition agreements of Israel Beitainu, Blue and White and Meretz and Labor for some form of limited marriage option Needless to say, none of that uh, has materialized. Uh, there was a point at which um, Kahana expressed support for the concept of consular marriages, saying, you know, why would the Israelis have to go to Cyprus in order to marry? Why can't they marry in the Cyprian embassy in Tel Aviv? Uh, that was short-lived. Uh, this, as you can see, was in February 14th, and there was an idea of a deal uh, there would be an agreement to allow consular marriages, but at the same time, there would be a surrender on the draft bill, drafting yeshiva students to the IDF, some kind of a package deal that did not go through. And uh, uh, more recently, uh, Kahana expressed uh, uh, his uh, sort of uh, abandoning the notion of consular marriages. And, and this is the, the last thing that I would say. One of the things in the coalition agreements that Meretz and I think Labour demanded was equal rights for LGBTQ. Now here is the truth of the matter. So the title is, this is, was in January, the title is children by surrogacy to be allowed for same sex couples, single men from next week. Now listen to these two short paragraphs. Surrogacy as a route to parenthood is currently open to heterosexual married couples and to single women who have genetic connection to the baby. That's the state of affairs now. In February 2020, the High Court of Justice struck down a controversial law that blocked single men and gay couples from using surrogacy to have children 
and gave the Knesset a year to pass a new law. Last July, the High Court of Justice ruled that all legislation denying surrogacy rights to same-sex couples and single men would be null and void in six months. At the time, the state asked the court to make a ruling on the matter since, since amending the law in line with the previous 2020 ruling was, quote, unfeasible, unquote, in the current political situation. So the important thing here is to understand why was it unfeasible in the current political situation? In part because of Yamina, but not just Yamina. Who else pulled the rug from under the legislation that the Supreme Court mandated? Ram, the Islamist Arab party, because they feel about LGBTQ the same that Shas feels about them they wouldn't touch such concessions with a 10-foot pole. They made it clear. And the opposition is united, even though Netanyahu promised, you know, when he was prime minister at some point during the, uh, that, that those, uh, the 2020 uh, events, he promised that they would be passing a law that would legalize surrogacy for LGBTQ couples. But, he didn't live up to that promise. And now it's clear they are going to vote against any legislation that the coalition proposes. They are going to vote exactly as the Haredi parties require of them, because they are, as we know, the natural allies, natural partners. So here we have a hint to, and if we had more time, I would be speaking more, because the whole area of legislation regarding draft draft of women, draft of yeshiva students, all of that is directly impacted, not just by the Haredi, but by the Arab parties. Both Ram and the United Arab List, Rashima um, Meshutefet. <laughs> and in this case, Ram was actually willing to go with the deal of the very, very watered down draft bill. I'm saying watered down and it's generous. Uh, uh, it's really, it really should be not be called a draft bill. It's the non-draft bill, but we won't have time to uh, to discuss that in detail. But Ram was possibly willing to go along with it, but what happened was that a Haredi Knesset member, uh, Arbel Moshe Arbel, published a call to Ram not to support the draft bill in Arabic. The Shas Knesset member published an appeal to Ram not to vote for the draft bill in Arabic. Arbel doesn't know Arabic. And the inside news revealed that it was Ahmed Tibi of United Torah Judaism that has enlisted the Haredi Knesset member Arbel and provided him with an Arabic text to publish as a public scrutiny, public pressure, public shaming of Ra'am, the, the, the Islamist Arab party, how dare you vote a bill that is involved in strengthening Israel's IDF. You can see the irony and the very intrinsic, the, the, the very complicated web that is, uh, that is uh, in place here that involves not only Ram, but also United, uh, the, United the, the opposition Arab uh, group, the United Arab uh, List. And of course, parallel to that, Rabbi Arya Deri spoke with Mansour Abbas and suggested to him that it would not be in their advantage to support the coalition draft bill. Why would it not be in their advantage? Not just because of the national uh, reasons, you know, how can you support the IDF? But we refrained from legislating, when we were in power, we refrained from legislating on internal Arab affairs. Don't get involved in legislating matters that are involving Jewish internal affairs. Because if you do, 
we have long memory and we will be back in government. And when we are back in government, here are the pieces of legislation that we are going to be advancing all aimed at interfering with the Muslim community. Well, with that in mind, uh, there is very little surprise that Mansour Abbas is not eager uh, to be providing the coalition with support for the uh, uh, draft bill. And as I mentioned here, he certainly did not, uh, did not uh, support. He, he made it very clear that if this is passed, he'll vote against it, and therefore it would not have a majority, and therefore it didn't come up for a vote and not coming up for a vote in spite of the coalition, the individual coalition agreements, and in spite of the fact that it enjoys wide majority support among the public, as a number of Hidush public opinion surveys have shown, who came to the rescue? The Supreme Court. And as you know, those who are following the events in Israel, the Supreme Court has been repeatedly demonized assaulted, threatened, intimidated because of this very reason, not because of LGBTQ, but because it is the only independent voice that has an authority to deal with issues in which the Knesset, unfortunately, goes against its own constitutional commitments and against reasonable decision-making and against due process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in this hint, you will see how important it is for all of us to defend and stand by and stand with and safeguard the independence and authority of the Supreme Court. All right, I'll stop here um, and let me, uh, now I'll send you the, uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. This, a lot more that's happening that I was going to share with you. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I plan to write something more detailed about it, so maybe it'll compensate you uh, for uh, being optimistic that uh, that you'll get it all in one webinar. All right, so let me stop the sharing of the... Uh, one moment. All right, so please, uh, those of you who want to comment, to say something, to ask something, uh, you know, use, raise your hand or not raise your hand here, but you can use the, you know, on the side there is reactions and in reactions, you can see the sign, raise a hand. I just raised my hand. Okay, Rabbi Eric Yoffi, and unmute yourself. Um, so okay. You. okay. Okay, thank you, Ori, as always, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, a specific question. I heard uh, uh, Gilan Kariv speak a few days ago and, uh, you know, acknowledging uh, um, much of what you said, he wanted to offer, I think, a little bit of hope and optimism. And he made a reference to funding that had been made available by the government uh, to the various movements and institutions, including reform institutions and movements. Uh, I, I wonder if you could sort of clarify that point for us, has such funding been made available? Is it significant? Will it continue? Thank you, uh, Eric, uh, very important. I certainly do not want to be uh, sounding uh, unilaterally or one-sided uh, and, uh, you know, and dark. Uh, that, that is not what I'm trying to do. Uh, and as I said, it, this is all connected in my mind, uh, on the one hand, to what's going to happen in the next round, and at the same time, how does all of that bear on you? Uh, so, first of all, specifically when you asked, and in the uh, continued uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation, you will see that, uh, that indeed, uh, Nachman Shai, the Minister of Diaspora Affairs, uh, who has been outstanding, both in terms of his support and defense of pluralism and uh, the streams, and in defense of uh, the counter view regarding Jewish and democratic state and our responsibility toward the, uh, toward the uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees. Uh, he has really been the lead voice uh, for morality and Jewish conscience. So early on, he said, and this is also integrated into the coalition agreements, the agreement with labor, 
that there would be a line in the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs budget for Jewish renewal. And that line was funded with 40 million shekels. It's intended for Jewish renewal. Now, Jewish renewal is more than just pluralism and the streams. I don't have an idea as to the specific workings of this budget line, but this is very true. There was indeed such a budget line and there was an added, I think, couple million shekels that was also um, initiated by Professor Alon Tal, who is the conservative with a capital C, the conservative Knesset member um, who is very active and, uh, and he was able to push for some additional state funding for pluralism. Having said that, the other thing that appears in the PowerPoint is state funding for religious purposes. The coalition agreements, the, the coalition, the guidelines of the government and the agreement with Yamina includes a commitment to continue funding. It's phrased in sort of a general formalistic fashion, but the bottom line is continue funding the ultra-Orthodox at the level that it used to be funded. Labor and merits in their agreements reserved the right to not vote with the coalition on the budget bill on this issue of funding for religious ultra-Orthodox causes. But having retained that right to vote against it, they did not implement that right. And not only has the budget bill included continued funding at the level of billions for yeshivas and for ultra-Orthodox schools, primarily the schools that are associated with the Shas party and with the Aguda United Torah Judaism party, political, organized, run and controlled huge school networks that are funded to the extent of 100% from the state coffers. Not only did they not uh, object to it, but the irony was that a couple of years ago, the reform movement applied for a sort of a tender that was published for a running educational programs on Shabbat. And the reform movement won. They submitted an outstanding proposal. So professionally, their bid won. That was about two years ago. If I understand correctly, they haven't received a dime yet. And at the same time that they have not received a dime, the Ministry of Education chose a way to get around the bid regarding Shabbat programming and went with an orthodox organization, non-profit, and provided it with millions, raising its past support that was quite minimal, provided them with millions to run Shabbat programs throughout the educational uh, uh, framework. So yes, Gilad is right. And I should say a word about Gilad. Gilad is outstanding. He, is, he has proven himself to be one of the most effective Knesset members, frankly, much more visible and much more felt than the leader of the Labour Party, than Merav Michaeli, and certainly than any other Knesset member. And he is effective. And I have attended a number of the Law and Constitution Committee that he heads. He runs them with grace and with uh, professionalism and with a, a really tremendous uh, um, sensitivity, um, especially since the ultra-Orthodox are you know, pulling out all kinds of tricks, uh, you know, Knesset member Porush is, is sitting on the floor and starting to recite psalms uh, and, and blow the chauffeur in the middle of the committee meeting. So Gilad is very gentle and very seriously so. Instead of calling on the guards to throw him out, he is announcing a break. Uh, and after a short break, you know, everybody can come back and, uh, you know, he has, he has had his, his game uh, and, uh, and now, you know, we can move on to business. So he's fantastic. 
But beyond being fantastic in general, in terms of his tenor, he is also doing tremendous work, for instance, in holding a series of hearings about the Aguna problem and really pushing the rabbinic courts uh, uh, administration on their treatment of Agunot, of those who are denied a get, and the protracted processes, etc. So we don't have time to go into more details. Gilad is right. There are bright spots. There is no question that the atmosphere in this coalition is far better than, uh, than, uh, uh, than what we were facing before. And the fact that there is a coalition that excludes the ultra-Orthodox, yes, they shout and curse and, 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 and you know, spread venom in their media and around the meetings, but they cannot control the government and cannot control the Knesset. So uh, there are lots of good things that are happening. Uh, and, and the last word I want to say about that is, Clearly, this puts to question your role in all of that. Do you have a role? As you can see, it, it is connected directly to the question of North American Judaism, the streams, the accusations are waged against you much more than they are waged against us in Israel. You are used as the, um, what, what's the word, boogie, uh, what's the word? Uh, Boogeyman. Boogeyman. Boogie you are used as, this. thank you, Ron. <laughs> Good to see you. You are used as the boogeyman to scare Israelis from uh, allowing pluralism to, uh, to reign in, uh, to, to spread in Israel. The North American Jewish leadership does not sufficiently understand that it has a role to play. The agreements, for instance, on the conversion that I am suggesting impacts negatively on continued recognition of non-Orthodox conversions should have been, uh, the, the partners to the coalition should have been under tremendous pressure by you not to go with that legislation. All right, there was an agreement to change the uh, religious community, change on this, okay, go, go ahead and do it. But to fundamentally change the face of Israeli law by introducing a full-fledged conversion bill that gives prominence and dominance to orthodoxy, God forbid. Funding, pressure on those who are open to your message, whether it is the likes of labor and merits, or Israel Beitenu for that matter, or reaching out to guns. They need to hear from you and understand that you are not sitting back just listening to, let's say, the calming, uh, you know, message of Gilad Kariv telling you there are good things happening, so sit back, you know, let us play this game. You need to be part of that because clearly we need to advocate on the Israeli side and understand that there is a going to be a next round. And in that next round, we should be speaking strongly and repeatedly on these issues of religious freedom and pluralism. And you need to lend a hand as well. Uh, in the last, uh, in the last uh, webinar with uh, uh, attorney Ed Friedman, talking about the international jurisdiction of the rabbinic courts that basically can lock down in, in, in jail and certainly prevent the, uh, the exit of uh, American uh, husbands whose wives chose to, they're both Americans, they have no connection to Israel, they've never been Israelis. But the courts, the rabbinic courts in Israel now claim international jurisdiction and they can halt Husbands whose wives decided that it's to their advantage to sue them before a rabbinic court in Israel for a get. This is an unheard of situation. There is no country in which religious courts claim international jurisdiction. And here the Knesset legislated a permanent international jurisdiction for the rabbinic courts. The organized Jewish community who knows better should have said not uh, uh, you know, not during our watch. 
Nobody said anything. All right. Uh, anybody else uh, before we close? Any other hands? I don't see any. Any other hands? Uh, if there is someone who doesn't know how to raise a hand but wants to ask something, uh, then uh, just unmute yourself and speak up. All right. If there are none, I'm surprised. Uh, <laughs> Alan, you. I, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I was about to say. All right. Thank you. I was just saying thank you. Okay, or, friends. Or, so or, or, let me just. Or, 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 let I, me. Ori, I just want to thank you for continuing this series, and Eric, thank you for your ongoing, uh, you know, op eds uh, in the in the. Uh, uh, right. Well, just so just a reminder: on April twenty fifth. We are going to have Dan Yakir, the legal uh, director of the Association of Civil Rights in Israel, speak about the LGBTQ uh, um, situation in Israel, how it unfolded from the time that there was a criminal offense about homosexual, homosexual even consenting uh, um, uh, relations. Uh, and Chaim Cohen, Alava Shalom, the, uh, then the Attorney General and subsequently Supreme Court Judge, and one of the shining luminaries of Israeli jurisdiction, um, Israeli law, uh, as an attorney general, he administratively ordered that no prosecution will be brought against consenting adults. But how this all developed into the reality today when Tel Aviv is considered to be, uh, I think, the top world or one of the top world destinations for LGBTQ uh, individuals and Israel has advanced legislation and legal practices and he'll also compare it to some of the uh, other international situations. So April 25th at the same time and then on June 1st Dr. Kobi Shapira from the Ministry of Justice is going to be speaking about who is a Jew, it's close to Shavuot, He's going to be speaking about who is a Jew using resources, um, halachic, rabbinic resources in the most popular uh, presentation, but they are fascinating sources that present, you know, as I usually say, halacha ain't necessarily what the chief rabbinate says it is. Uh, they are they're fascinating, different faces that one finds in the uh, halachic traditional sources that point to alternative approaches to conversion. So, June 1st, Lehitraot, good night, and thank you all. And Chag Sameach, and please remember, that this is the Festival of Liberty. Uh, so, time to recommit to working for liberty in all its fashions. Thank you. Okay.